Uh, we have a, a special artist here with us today. I'm just going to read a prepared intro. intro. Uh, Beatriz, Cortez is, uh, Beatriz Cortez is a Los Angeles-based artist and scholar. She was born in El Salvador and has lived in the United States since 1989. She holds an MFA from the California Institute of the Arts and a PhD in Latin American literature from Arizona State University. She teaches in the Department of Central America Studies at California State University, Northridge. Her work has been exhibited internationally, including the Hammer Museum, LA, Whitney Museum of American Art, New York, Ballroom Marfa in Marfa, Texas, and Bank Gallery, Shanghai, China. Her solo show, Trinidad, Joy Station, opens at the Craft and Folk Art Museum in Los Angeles on January 27th. Please welcome Beatriz Cortez. Thank you. Thank you. Is it okay if I lower this? I'm too short. I want to thank all of you for being here and Rebecca Ripo, especially for this generous invitation to dialogue with her and with all of you today. Um, she has been a mentor to me and her work and her practice have inspired me so much and I'm really happy to, oh, sorry. I'm really happy to see her here um, in this amazing program where I know that she will make an impact on the artists of today and of the future. Uh, I also want to thank all of the MFA students in the sculpture department for making me feel so welcome and spending time with me. I'm sure I sure have had an enjoyable visit so far, and I am looking forward to visiting all the studios tomorrow as well. And especially to Francis Chung, who organized all the logistics for my visit, and everything has been so wonderful, so thank you. Well, let me get started over here with my images. In general, um, I don't know how you want to do it. If you want to ask questions, I know that the room seems so serious, but feel free to interrupt me anytime and ask um, questions. So, and if not, we'll also leave room at the end for us to have a conversation. In general terms, my work is about the memory of growing up in the Civil War in El Salvador and about my experiences of migration as I moved First to Arizona, where I lived for almost 11 years before coming to Los Angeles in 2000 via Detroit. But my work is also about the experiences of simultaneity, being in two different time frames, living in two places at once, San Salvador and Los Angeles, existing in two or more, but different versions of modernity in different cultural worldviews, moving back and forth between different technologies. And more importantly, my work is about the future. I build memories so I can imagine possible futures. Because of this, there are three concepts that are central to my work. Time, simultaneity, and movement. And I'm interested in how issues such as race, class, migration, or gender intercept or cut through those concepts. Time has become such a central idea in my work, particularly my effort to break with chronologies. For instance, I didn't know this then, but when I reconstructed a miniature version of my childhood bedroom, um, which you see here was the size of a tray, pretty much, um, in order to make a video piece, and we have two stills from it here, my objective was to construct memory, to revisit a place that had been taken from me, but also to talk about the passing of time and about the lushness of life that continues moving forward. Once I had completed the video piece, I was able to see that I had inserted there a couple of things from my present that could not possibly be in my past. My parrot's cage and images of Bishop Romero, um, which you couldn't have on the wall during the time of the war. In other words, I had also made interventions in the chronological order of time. When I built a sculpture with soil and seeds that was meant to honor the unknown, dead who have been thrown like trash in war and migration, and I watered it every day until it became a garden, I did not realize that I was honoring someone who was not there at the moment and that I was crossing barriers of time and space and already playing with the concept of the untimely. 
I have built installations with books, installations that were about the memory of living in the war, about censorship, about violence, and about living in fear. I began burning books and burying books, as people did with their own books during the war in El Salvador so that they wouldn't become targets of violence. But I built those installations with the books that I have today in my library. I hid the books that I thought would be banned today if the war happened in our own context. And when I built an armor made of steel for Rufina Maya, a woman who was the only survivor of a massacre that happened in 1981 in the town of El Mosote in El Salvador, a day after I turned 11, I wanted to protect her in 1982 when, re when she really needed the armor. And I wasn't able to make her one. And I wanted to protect her memory even though she's no longer alive and her testimonies continue unfolding through YouTube today without my help. Also, the environment has been an important source of metaphors in my work. Even as I work with industrial steel, I am gesturing towards returning this industri industrial material that has been artificially extracted from the earth back to the land. Building rocks with steel is an example of that gesture. However, it is through my work with plants that I have understood that our mark on this planet is not only written on the sedimentation layers or on the rock, but also on the living environment. After all, a garden is an artificial arrangement of plants, and we have lots of examples here all over the place as we walk around Cranbrook, a form of human intervention with cultural and historical content about class, about race, about culture, and so plants have allowed me to build metaphors about eugenics, about labor, about migration, hybridity, ancient knowledge, and others. For many years now, I have considered myself a Delusian thinker. It happened slowly. I arrived there via queer theory. Queer theory gave me the possibility to explore a space of blurriness and non-definition that fit the experience of the migrant. Soon enough, I became fascinated with the philosophers of the Delusian family. For me, being a nomad was conceptually exemplified by the idea of queerness and its refusal to exist within the given diagrams of compulsive heterosexuality. Slowly, the idea of Spinozian joy came to the picture, and then came movement, matter, destruction, time, as I read Haraway, Braidotti, Barad, Colbrook, Peter Osborne, and many others. From there on, movement became a central idea in my thinking, one that brought together my theoretical framework and my life experiences. Growing up in a war weighs heavily over my artistic practice, especially since it, had, it has not had a symbolic end, since there, isn't, there hasn't been recognition of what violence took place, no contrition on the part of those responsible, no justice. And so I have been invested in building, building memory through my work. And one day I realized that I was, it was complicated to, bring to, get, to, to, to build work that was invested in a particular moment in the past to coincide with the philosophical framework related to movement that was central to my thinking. And at the time I was reading The Posthuman by Rossi Braidotti and I was fascinated by the possibility of creating work that enabled untimely conversations with my favorite philosophers or that symbolically made it possible to establish a conversation with others who inhabited a different space or time. And so I imagined an untimely conversation with Deleuze. He complained that I had, he came to visit my studio. He complained that I had decided to make a moment in the past, the war, the central element in my work. The most important moment in your life already happened. He, I imagined that he said, I'm a thinker of the future and you're a thinker of the past. And this is how he slammed the door and he left in a moment of crisis turned the future into a central element in my work. As a result, the concept of time and the ability to intervene in the chronological order became important in my work. And one of the philosophers who helped me out of that crisis uh, and, uh, and impacted my understanding of time was Peter Osborne because he questions the imposition of modernity as a way to establish a chronology and a universal narrative of time. He argues that the effort to establish a narrative about modernity towards progress, towards development, is a colonial and homogenizing effort to erase diversity. And so 
Rather than a chronology, Osborne is interested in the exploration of different modernities coexisting simultaneously. Ideas about speculative realism, the posthuman, philosophies of extinction invited me to consider the imposition of seeing humanism, liberalism, the enlightenment as the only way, a colonial way to understand reason and with it to understand time. So instead I became interested in other ways of understanding time, circular conceptual constructions of time, multiplicity, simultaneity. This image is the time machine. I built this time machine with simultaneous capabilities that evoke the city of Los Angeles and the city of San Salvador with the same light. I projected a video of Los Angeles that you can barely see here, but um, there's a building in the middle of the central part of that panel that's the Griffith Observatory. Um, Rebecca and I like to walk up that um, hiking trail to see it. It's a beautiful view of Los Angeles and somewhat removed from Los Angeles. And every time I walked up that hill, I always looked at Los Angeles, which does not look like San Salvador. And I always said, wow, that looks exactly like San Salvador. And I thought that there's something about the distance and something about the perspective that made them so such a deja vu every time I walked up that hill. So I projected this video that is slightly oscillating of, the, of Los Angeles viewed from Griffith Park on this exterior panel, and I opened thousands of holes with different drill bits that allowed me to create a video with rudimentary technology for the night view of San Salvador in the interior space of the installation. Um, there's a, also a swing inside, so when you're inside, the video is also oscillating because of your own motion on the swing. I also built a memory machine with gears of different shapes and sizes that were all find, uh, found materials um, on a trip to El Salvador, I, I collected these wheels, these gears were part of the printing presses that were used to mimeograph material. And they turn in circular motion with, um, there's a little tiny microwave oven motor that's um, installed on top of the wooden base and that move all the gears except for the one at the top left corner, that one is a clutch, and it's, uh, it's an interactive piece with a hand, with a crank of a um, corn mill, a very old one. Um, so I also built this machine and other machines that had the ability to produce joy, and that uh, people complained all the time about my machines, um, things like, for example, it doesn't do anything. Um, it, does, it doesn't produce anything from the perspective of capitalism. I began to experiment instead with building memory, with producing joy, with play, and this is how I made also the beast. The beast is a pinball machine that I brought back to life uh, from an old abandoned play field. I bought a piece of wood of the play field and I rebuilt it with both the mechanical um, technology and the and Arduino technologies. And, um, it showed a crumbling modernity, maybe you can see better in this image, a crumbling modernity underneath and a new version of modernity on top. Um, it originally had the narrative of a black pyramid that was where the train is and um, a guy that looks like Indiana Jones stealing all the jewels from a pyramid at the bottom. And um, then I tagged it with lacquer markers and uh, I turned it into the beast, which is also the name of the train that brings immigrants through Mexico. Um, so it, show, it showed these different types of modernities and different types of technologies. And it was a machine with a circular logic where a ball traverses a field marked by the obstacles of immigration. And as much as the person playing attempts to keep the ball in the field, it is eventually expelled or deported from the field. But the machine is there, ready for another try. And so the spectators continue to send the ball in and collaborate collectively in keeping the ball in the play field one effort at a time. 
This piece, which engages with a history of migration and deportation, also examines through play the life of the immigrants impacted by chance and by forces outside of their control. Then I began making fortune teller machines. This is the first one that I made in collaboration with a Kakchikel collective um, of a Mayan community in the town of Patsicia in Guatemala. And um, soon after, I made another one that I made in collaboration with a group of immigrants and people who had crossed the border. Um, this one that, was, that I made in collaboration with Cajai Moloch, an indigenous Cachiquel collective in the town of Patsicia in Guatemala. Um, we had been collaborating at the time for about seven years and on several projects, and we had made some, um, some work. I mean, we had organized things together. They had already made exhibitions that were Part, part of their effort to preserve collective memory in their town, and that had photographs from different indigenous families in the town that they had collected and borrowed and, and they had shown, but this was the first time that we made artwork together. And what for me was artwork, for them was not artwork, and they made it very clear, we don't wanna be artists. Um, that's not interesting to us but we wanna make this artwork with you and you can call it artwork and we will call it memory. And we, and we said, okay. And uh, I wanted to have a way to predict the future. And I said, um, they said, okay, but let's not put our, um, our spiritual leaders in the picture. So we decided to go for a parakeet, which looks a lot like my parrot. And um, this one is, is um, a mechanical bird that has a motion detector and that um, one can buy in Amazon. And, um, and then we decided to go for that because in the small town fairs in Central America, you can, um, you can play a game where a little parakeet will pick a piece of paper and tell you your future. And so this was a grammar that people would understand easily in their town and that people would understand easily here. And so it was difficult for us to find a way to compromise and also make sure that we were able to convey meaning in different places, thinking about different destinations. And um, I asked them if they could give me a list of the things that they, they wanted for the future that each of them, their desires for the future, and then I programmed their desires onto the machine. And I remember when I received that list, how impacted I was by that list. When, first of all, because so many of the desires were in the negative, and um, that impressed me because I imagined if I ever had a genie appear to me and say, you can have anything you want, I would never say, I don't want this. Um, and so the fact that their desires were in the negative, that they wanted things to disappear from the reality was so powerful for me. And, you know, forced me to think a lot about how to make other works um, together. But when you press a button, the, you get a ticket that says things like, when the future comes, there will be no genocide. We will not be humiliated. We will not be murdered. And I realized then that a lot of their responses were expressed in this negative that um, allowed all of us to see the lacking, the, the, their expression of the, of the precariousness of, of their reality. And then I made this migrant edition and I was really interested in the fact that all the desires were very positive, even when they were talking about difficult things. I interviewed a group of migrants and people who had crossed the border and I asked them to share their desires for the future. And this time I asked them, thinking about Rosie Braidotti and how she talks about building collective nomadic subjectivities for the future, um, I asked them to write their desires in the future perfect tense in plural. So all the desires say things like, uh, when the future comes, we will have done this. We will have done that. And um, their, their prints then um, say things, for example, like, when the future comes, we will have met our relatives in person which talks about divided families and talks about the difficulties of, of keeping alive together in a virtual space, but it also talks about the hope. And um, this fortune teller is based on the idea that words have power and that one can will the future into being. 
and that we can build a collective nomadic subjectivity. Then I kept experimenting with play, and I made a jukebox um, for a show that was called Nomad World. Um, it had four different pieces, the pinball machine, the jukebox, um, the fortune teller, and a photo booth. And so the, for the jukebox, I, I programmed a lot of the soundscapes that I had recorded in Central America. For example, I was driving my car and next to me there was a guy with a megaphone announcing the circus or I was walking around and there was a guy selling popsicles and saying, vaya las paletas, las paletas. You know, and so all these sounds of the parakeets going by at 6 p.m. that evoked a, a certain landscape for me um, without any instructions opened up the possibilities for people to imagine being in other places that, that I could not determine. And, um, and to go back in time, to move in space, to travel to another reality, to be into places at once. The photo booth for me was a project that I began to create thinking about people who did not have documents and who could not go back home like everybody else, so could not visit um, El Salvador, Mexico, Guatemala, could not take a picture in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, and post it on Facebook. And so I began thinking about that, about social media and the virtual space that links together the divided families and our divided lives. And seeing the public play with the photo booth reminded me that art like play can allow us to experiment with different ideas about space and time and be faster and slower and so forth. This is um, the street where I grew up in San Salvador. You can see the volcano at the end of the road and this is the historic part of Guatemala City. Uh, this is Antigua, Guatemala. And this is Tegucigalpa. The, uh, there's an old, like, um, I think it's the old pres presidential palace down t in the historic town. So returning to the concept of time and to the experience of migration, I built an installation called the Cosmos. At this time, I began thinking about immigration as part of my past, but also the Cosmos as part of the future. And the idea that we could fragment our identity, that we could abandon identity, that maybe for me it was a moment when I was also separating from post-colonial theory and uh, imagining becoming other, imagining possibilities towards the future, and um, imagine, imagining um, death as a way to, you know, multiply ourselves, become cosmic dust, move at speed light, I mean at light speed, sorry, and become some, become invisible. There was, um, there was a reference in this piece to the old Moroccan mirror mazes that were built uh, about 100 years before in the um, world fairs, but instead of being the mirror mazes where you could see yourself many times, in this one, if you stood at certain angles, you would disappear, so you could approach it quite a bit and still not see your reflection. And I, so I was interested in that idea of disappearing as opposed to um, what my mother would say, when I die, I'm gonna come and pull your leg. You know, I, I was trying to imagine when I die, I won't be able to pull your leg because I won't exist as myself. I will be cosmic dust or something else. And so that was basically the idea behind this. And um, so my installation, The Cosmos, was about the fragmentation of identity and future becoming. It included the Untimely Conversations box, but before that, I wanted to play for you uh, the sound inside it. So basically, here you can't see, but you can see the reflection. Of, there's another pinball machine that was also part of this show that was called The Cosmos. There's a kaleidoscope. There was an X on the floor. If you stood there, you could see your image multiplied in many pieces circulating. And there was a door to this structure, the spaceship. It had a little door. 
And when you went inside, you could hear Ishi singing, and Ishi was an indigenous man who came down Mount Lassen in California, and he um, was basically taken to the Anthropology Museum in Berkeley, UC Berkeley, and in the daytime, he was part of the exhibits. He was uh, living part of the exhibits at nighttime. I think he had to clean the museum, too. And um, they never found anyone who spoke his language. So anthropologists very quickly declared that he was the last speaker of the Yami language. We don't know if that's true, because there are so many people that have been declared the last speaker of many different languages. But what mattered to me was that Ishii couldn't find anyone to talk to anymore, so he would sing to himself. So those songs with Ishii's language is what you find in this space capsule that's coming from the past or the future um, to this space. And then um, there were lots of gestures that made by the light in the space and a box of uh, the, the untimely conversations box that to me invited us to imagine death in a different way, allow, allowed us to break um, time and space barrier. And so we could have a conversation with different people that had said things that I liked about death or becoming and continue a conversation with someone who's not here at that moment. Or of course, it also meant to me that others who have not been born yet could have conversations with us when we're dead. Um, well, in conversation with the cosmos, I made this installation that is also circulating light in a similar way, but this one is, this structure is called Black Mirror, and I built it in Cerritos College as part of a residency that I had worked there, um, uh, that I had there working in the auto body shop. I, um, I worked with vintage machines and stretchers and shrinkers, curving the metal to make it, um, to make each one of the pentagons and the hexagons in this geodesic dome uh, have the curvature that I wanted. And then after making these beautiful hexagons, then I, I um, attached each of them to the others with zip ties, which mortified everyone in the auto body shop, and they did tell me many times that they were capable of attaching things with bolts and that this was not the way to attach a structure that was very heavy and could fall on everyone and so forth because for them it was really important not to att attach things in a way that looks like I went to the desert and I built a tent in five minutes, even though, of course, it had required like 12 of us to install it. Um, so to me, this was this um, mixture of industrial and temporary and precarious structure that also carried inside um, the, the found recording of a man by the name of Arthur Tugood who um, had made all those videos that you see on the wall they were videos to convince people to go to vocational school, and they were part of an effort after World War II to convince people to become part of the blue collar workers. So um, it says things like, if you don't mind the grease, you could be a welder. If um, you are good at climbing things, you could be an electrician. And so it had all these uh, little statements that were almost clinical and reminded me of Foucault quite a bit. And so th that was the sound that you could fi uh, find inside that structure. But on the outside, there was a little note that said that in ancient Mesoamerican cultures, there were huge mirrors made of uh, obsidian stone, polished obsidian, and that those mirrors were used to predict one's destiny. So you could look at the, at the piece as a black mirror and predict your destiny. You could go inside and listen to the voice of modernity telling us that your destiny is within the blue collar workers system. Or you could um, use the, there was also um, an aptitude test box that I built and there you could press a button and get um, a ticket that told you what you could become. And those, and the possibilities were between being a carpenter, an electrician, a welder, 
or a welder supervisor. Um, and so the aptitude test box reproduced the sound that I had removed from the videos because the videos were called speculative interventions in time. I removed the sound and I put a new soundtrack and I imagined that I had been the person in charge of designing the educational system in the United States in the 1950s and that, and then I put a new voice and so it, it didn't say the same things that it said before about being a welder because that was the same week that, that um, both Obama and Marco Rubio had said the same thing. Obama had said that the first two years of college should be free, and Marco Rubio had said, we don't need more philosophers, we need more welders. And to me, that was the same exact statement. And so I, um, I was interested in, in imagining another system, another educational system. And um, then I, I began thinking about extinction and began reading about the non-human and about a future after humans, particularly through the work of Claire Colbrook. She's an Australian philosopher that works in Penn State and I accepted her invitation to imagine a non-human geologist of the future. She imagined it as a rover, kind of like the ones that, that are in Mars, you know, I mean on Mars. and. Um, this future geologist was reading our mark on the planet and this a non-human geologist of the future would read the sedimentation layers, the rocks, the stones, for traces of the Anthropocene, for traces of human life, life on the planet. And it's a job that it will be not, not an easy job for the machine, I imagined. Uh, and lava came to my mind as a material that to me became really funny because it would confuse the geologists of the future and would blur the records because um, it would break the chronological order of time. So I imagine lava as this lava from the past that the volcano was spitting and changing the order of the layers that write the temporal history of our passing through the earth and spitting the past onto the future and confusing everyone. And so this is how I began to explore different ways in which matter breaks chronology and I began working with lava. I built Cairn first here outside the Brand Library in Glendale in Los Angeles and later on inside Rafa Esparza's figure ground beyond the white field at the Whitney Biennial. By the way, the, in the day when I got there, everyone was quite concerned about the fact that I was building this piece without any glue or cement and or a structure made of steel inside and that I was using the actual indigenous methods for building. And I said, don't worry, don't worry, lava is not dangerous at all. And I picked up a piece of lava and I cut my finger and nobody at the, at the Whitney could find a Band-Aid. And <laughs> it was really funny to us how um, bad it went trying to convince them that this was not dangerous material. <laughs> Um, but um, to me, it was really important to build it in this way. It was a mound of stone serving as a landmark. Indigenous peoples have built cairns for centuries to mark the way on a trail, to mark sacred ground, to mark a burial ground, or other things. Within modernity, a cairn is used to deline delineate private property or to trace a border between two nations, between the United States and Mexico, there's one cairn every mile, more or less, in some areas of the border. Um, and at the turn of the 20th century in Los Angeles, this indigenous way of building with river rocks was often used to build craftsman and Spanish colonial revival houses in what came to be known as a vernacular style of architecture. And it was an ancient form of construction applied to a modern architectural style. But to me, what mattered is that while indigenous peoples imagined it as a nomadic structure that they could say, okay, here's the hunting, the way to go hunting, but in the summer, we'll move it over there. For us, it was really important to diagram space in a permanent way, and that was a, the big difference between using cement and not using cement. Um, and so I, I found this man who had built all these houses in my neighborhood, and in a neighborhood in Sunland, that's by the five freeway in Los Angeles called um, Stonehorst. His name was Dan Montelongo and he was an indigenous builder, an Apache Mescalero. This is, this is one of the markers that he built. It, it has rocks and it has like um, sand, 
stucco kind of thing, but it doesn't have, it was made in 1914. Um, so my interest in stones, I, I mean, I was interested in stones. I could see all these places in Pasadena, in Highland Park, in other places, but I, I didn't think that anyone built like that Montelongo, and I was really impressed by the fact that he was invisible, that I had never even heard his name, that, um, that he was an indigenous builder, but that everyone called this LA vernacular style of architecture and not the coexistence of indigenous craftsman and colonial architecture put together. And I was really interested in the fact that even his tomb had disappeared because there were these crooks that sold the tombs like three times in this um, little cemetery by the Burbank airport. And um, there are streets named after them, Osborne and others, but his tomb they can't find. And the people at the cemetery keep trying to convince me to accept that I didn't love him, I didn't know him, just let it go and stop making us look for this tomb. Um, but I go periodically to see what they have found because Dan Montelongo has disappeared from the history completely and yet his work is so amazing. And um, so I was really interested, I found uh, this, this district has 92 of his houses. Um, they're tiny little cabins that people from Hollywood at the time would go this really far away to Sunland. Now you can get there so fast, but there were no freeways then. And they would go there to live in these cabins and to ride horses and to hang out for the weekend. Um, but my interest in stones in the greater lifetime that they have in the long count of time in comparison to humans, in the ways that object-oriented ontologies made me pay attention to the work of a great master, Dan Montelongo. He was an Apache Mescalero stonemason who built more than 90 houses in what is now the historic Stonehurst neighborhood in Sunland. And he also built houses in San Fernando, Silmar, La Crescenta, Glendale, Pasadena. His indigenous way of constructing porch columns and fireplaces made me realize that what we call LA vernacular is a syncretic style where ideas about craftsman constructions, indigenous stone constructions co coexist with colonial ideas about plantation architecture. Located outside the home, that's a picture of him, by the way, that I found in his archives. Um, the porch is both public and private. As part of the Los Angeles craftsman vernacular movement, the porch exists both inside and outside modernity. This is one of the fireplaces that I made uh, after him. The porch exists both inside and outside modernity. Its craftsman dimension meant that it was built with handcrafted details as a way to resist industrialization and to bring, bring beauty to daily life. It was linked to the back to the land philosophy that encouraged the construction of buildings with local materials. And also it exhibited an ancient indigenous way of construction with rocks evoking the foundations of the Templo Mayor built by the Aztecs or the Mayan pyramids, the Inca temples or the Inca aqueducts, spirals in Nazca among others. And while porches are often represented as part of a homologous, homogeneous American tradition, this is the porch that I'm started, starting to build, they have multicultural legacies that relate both to the history of slavery and slave labor in the construction of emerging towns and urban spaces, and also to a history of colonization in the United States and, and the Americas. It is a complex symbol. It can at once represent a space of cultural coexistence in contemporary California and a colonial legacy. It represents a history of resistance to industrialization and a history of privilege, because who could afford that? It opens a space for community interaction, but also isolates the home as a space for privilege, making the porch the only accessible space for those foreign, undeserving, undesired bodies not belonging in the interior space of the home. It is a piece about time warps, about gentrification that replicates the porch of one of Dan Montelongo's constructions, but this time I made it with industrial sheet metal like a construction of a future without wood, without rocks, but a future with nostalgia for those materials, and at once a past of a beautiful home that was once built for the elites of the city of San Fernando, but that through the circular passing, 
sorry, but that through the circular passing of time had gone to new hands. I need just a second because I pressed something that wasn't, I wasn't supposed to press. Um, but through the circular passing of 100 years came to be the home of a Lakota woman, which is why I called it the Lakota porch, a time traveler who enjoys on a daily basis the construction of an Apache man. This is um, when we're done installing it at the Orange County Museum of Art. And this is at the beginning of the show, but I didn't seal it, and I let it age and be marked by the presence of the visitors, and so this is kind of what it looked like towards the end of the show. I built the Lakota porch as an homage to Dan Montelongo, but also as an homage to immigrants who today are the gardeners and domestic workers in houses such as this one. You see, I like to think that immigrants will one day own some of the houses that they clean today some of the gardens that they keep today. On the other hand, I have always been interested in deconstructing the ways in which indigenous cultural production is pushed to the imagined past and erased from our imagined future. So I wanted to build a space capsule that invites the viewer to imagine indigenous aesthetics in our future. It has a river rock fireplace in its interior as well as rocks in its ex exterior. However, there are stones from another place and time. There are stones formed by sheet metal produced for industrial purposes and brought back to the earth to, to exist as stones. These are the rocks from elsewhere, rocks that could very well be remnants of industrialization. I'll show it to you in a minute. But first I wanted to tell you a little bit about extinction and how I'm imagining extinction is an important part of this work that I, where I'm making the rocks because there are no rocks. And I'm making everything because I'm nostalgic for it, all the materials that we have destroyed. Uh, I'm reading The Death of the Posthuman <clears throat> Essays on Extinction by Claire Colebrook, where she argues that our human beings are the authors of our own extinction. Meaning that we overconsume, that we destroy the environment, and that we crave fats and sugars and also the destruction of the environment that we need in order to exist. And for her, it is important to think of the possibility that humans are about to disappear and that the human era, the Anthropocene, is about to end. And so she reminds us that human beings are not necessary for the planet's existence that for the world to continue, that other eras without us have preceded us and other eras without us will follow. And in terms of the time that the planet has existed, we have not been but a brief lapse in its history. It is from this perspective that I'm interested in thinking that humans are not necessary for memory to exist, that it is possible to think of a post-human memory or a non-human memory, for instance, the memory contained in lava or the memory contained in plants. But returning to Colebrook for a moment, I would like to also mention that her reflections about the human eye became really important to me because she defines the eye conceptually as the organ that organizes the world, the synthesizer that reads, theorizes, and organizes everything it sees, but also is what we call kind of like eyeballing. We check her everyone out. I, I see you and I figured you out. And that's what the eye does. And it's, but in doing that, it's eyeballing everything and um, making everything kind of uniform. And so she says that the uh, human animal or the human eye is torn between, between the spectacle or captivation and speculation, ranging beyond the present at the cost of its own life. And on the other hand, she points out that the eye, the one that synthesizes and digests the world for us, is a corporeal eye that in order to see it reproduces our humanity and her perspective on the human eye shows that what it sees but also frames the human body that contains it, much in accordance to the way in which Judith Butler argued that a photographer, even if not visible within the frame of a photograph, is always present in that image. And in her conversation with Bergson, Colbrook reminds us that the human eye organizes the world into conceptualized units, mastering the world by reducing difference. 
And of course, I'm interested in difference. I don't want to reduce difference. And so the eye, that human eye, takes what it sees, pays attention to some details, puts some images into our view, and organizes, digests, and erases, and makes invisible others. And from this perspective, the eye that sees is the one that constitutes the human subject. But on the other hand, she says, another way to deal with the eye is to think of the eye as a machine. And she follows the loose then, and she says, well, I wonder if it's possible for non-human perception, she says, if it's possible to imagine a world without us, not the world as our environment, our surroundings, but the world without an, during an era where human beings no longer exist, or to open us up to the inhuman and the superhuman durations, to go beyond the human condition. In that sense, the non-human eye, the machine eye, could edit in more difference, could potentially see other details and other diversities that the human eye does not see. It could complicate things and see beyond the human limits. And for instance, a selfie would be per, a perspective per excellence within the diagrams of humanism, while the image generated by an X-ray that our dentist takes or the landscape projected by the camera while our body endures a colonoscopy could be examples of the vision of a machine that we don't recognize even though it's still us. And so Colbrook imagines a machine eye that exists when humans have ceased to exist on the planet and it's an eye that reads the sediments that the humans have left through their time on the planet and the remains of the Anthropocene, what she calls the scars of the strata of the earth that mark human life through it. And this machine eye would move through the earth as a researcher moves today through an archive, as an archeologist moves through a site and would read the world, its anthropologic scars, its survival in spite of human existence on its surface. Colebrook imagines this machine eye as a geologist of the future. This non-human geologist of the future would detect other rhythms, would take different points of view about what has been recorded on Earth, and maybe would be like one of those rovers, maybe it would read up our present at a moment when it will have become the past, maybe it will read what has not yet been recorded at a time when it ha will have become the past, and this world will not be seen from a human body, it will be a world not for a body, it will be an impersonal image, her invitation is to think about extinction and the possibility to abandon subjectivity, as I was trying to do in the cosmos, more or less, but through, through abandoning the lens of humanism. And that's how she invites us to think about deconstruction, too, not, not as in Derrida, going towards context, but as in the man, going towards the future, as if the humans that this text, this work of art was made for, have not been born yet. And so these images that you see are Maria Teresa Alves' work, um, Seeds of Change, that Hammer Museum curators Erin Cristobal and Ann Elgood came to visit my studio before they invited me to be part of the Made in LA show. And in passing, Ann mentioned the ways in which my work connected to the work of Maria Teresa Alves. Her comment made an impact in my practice because when I looked at Alves's work, it allowed me to reflect about all the knowledge and memory contained in plants and the post-human worlds of plants, the non-human possibilities held in plants. Her project, Seeds of Change, installed at the port in different European cities, including Bristol, Marseille, Liverpool, invites the viewer to reflect upon the legacy of colonialism through the displacement of plants and their seeds traveling as part of ballast or disposable materials that were discarded by the ships upon their return from the Americas to where they took humans to be sold and enslaved. Life in the dormant seeds remained latent for centuries and the artist turned gardener was able to germinate them once again in order to create beautiful gardens displaced from their social political histories, ancient indigenous plants from the Americas growing on European portal towns, a visible remnant of slavery. And it was in part due to these reflections about her and um, also my time in Detroit, which is where I found the history of eugenics through the abandoned hospitals where people were sterilized and that were paid by, funded by the, the Kellogg's found, Foundation, um, that I began to think about 
about eugenics, I went to the archives at Caltech where there, there's a genetics lab and genetics archives and I, and I found the name of Paul Popeno and that name caught my attention. This is, by the way, the Popeno's bedroom and his portrait in Antigua, Guatemala. I had been to the Casa Popeno Museum in Antigua, Guatemala several times. It was the house of Wilson Popeno, the director of, for over 25 years of the Pan American School of Agriculture, also known as El Zamorano, the United Fruit Company had established in Zamora, Honduras. And it was in these archives in Los Angeles that I realized that the Popeno last name not only evoked the Zamorano or the United Fruit Company, but also a history of racism and eugenics. His brother, Paul Popeno, had served as the secretary of the Human Betterment Foundation in Pasadena during the 1930s and 1920s, and it was an organization that advocated for the forced sterilization of people, of blacks, Latinos, indigenous peoples, migrants, the ill, the poor people on welfare, and it also evoked a history of colonialism, especially since both Paul Popeno and Wilson Popeno had participated in the program of agricultural explorers. This is a, an article that he wrote honoring Hitler. And this is um, eugenics, what? Building. Oh, where they had the competitions for the best fit baby. And this is a picture of Wilson Popeno as an agricultural explorer. Interesting outfit for an explorer. The Department of Agricultural Explor Explorers was created by the United States Ministry of Agriculture in 1909. Each of these explorers was charged with the task of traveling throughout the world in search for new crops that could be transplanted to the United States. At the time, there was a man by the name of Fred Popeno, their father, who had a nursery in Altadena, and he ex encouraged them to go and to help him um, build, contribute to um, win lots of competitions and build his nursery, but also they brought dates and they helped establish Coachella. Um, they traveled through Iraq, the Persian Gulf, the Red Sea, the north of Africa, and, and the result of their first expedition was not only the transplant of date crops to California, creating an oasis with palms in an inhospitable uh, desert. They also established there, in places such as Coachella, La Quinta, Palm Desert, among others, an Orientalist culture and festival that included belly dancers, camel rides, this is Dorothea Lang's photograph of his plantation, by the way. Today, you can go to a game in Coachella and the uh, halftime has belly dancers still. Popeno Brothers, important symbol that exists between the imperialistic extraction of natural goods, goods from Central America and the rejection of Central American immigrants in the United States also established their conviction that genetic experimentation would allow them to build a world for whites whom they considered superior. Afterwards, Wilson Popeno dedicated himself to experimenting genetically with bananas in Central America and to transporting plants to California, among them the avocados that are now known as California avocados. Meanwhile, Paul dedicated himself to experimenting with humans contributing to the sterilization of a great number of people in California. Their work through the Human Betterment Foundation sparked great interest in Germany during the 1930s and was allowed to continue in California under the protection of the law until the late 70s when I was already alive. However, when World War II ended and now without the popularity that eugenics enjoyed during the German Nazi regime, Paul Popeno dedicated himself to expanding his eugenics project to phase two and established here, this is on Sunset Boulevard and Western, um, the first marriage counseling programs meant to maintain support superior couples married and procreating. He created the National Family Defense Fund in Hollywood and began publishing a series of columns in the newspaper titled Can This Marriage Be Saved? and radio and reality TV shows titled Divorce Court. 
And so these ideas, I'm going to skip that because I, I want to finish in a couple minutes. These ideas about the memory of plants have flourished in my art practice. I created the memory insertion capsule, which you see here, as part of Mundos Alternos Art and Science Fiction in the Americas, a steel structure that takes the form of a space capsule, but also brings together indigenous forms of architecture just like the LA vernacular style of architecture, including now an industrial view of Los Angeles constructions, and also talked about the precarious living inside a tent, evoking in this way multicultural coexisting in Los Angeles, refugee and housing crisis, and it included a visor that you can see in this um, image that looks like an eye, and it has this um, stereograph viewer where you, can, you could see um, fragments of the bits and pieces that I took from the archives that show now Dr. Paul Popeno, because he had received an honorary doctorate from Occidental College, Dr. Paul Popeno telling women how they should learn how to cook and keep their husbands happy so that uh, they could remain married, or um, you could see different fragments of the things that I just showed you, and videos and other things from the archives. And those memories were taken directly from uh, the United Fruit Company archives and the Caltech archives. And so my, my time is running out, but I would like to briefly mention um, a Garden, Noma 13, was a collaboration with Los Angeles-based artist Rafa Esparza. It was a sculpture made in the shape of a space capsule, a cosmic garden that preserved the knowledge and culture of ancient indigenous peoples in the America for the survival and pleasure of the humans of the future. Noma 13 takes the form of an unconventional space capsule built of adobe, bricks, and steel, and houses a garden of plants um, indigenous to the Americas, evoking a long history of migrating plants cultivated by the Inca, the Maya, the Aztec civilizations, these ancient plants known for their wholesome nutritional qualities and profound spiritual meanings. In symbolically sending these plants into the cosmos, not only Rafa Esparza and I were fighting with the idea that gardens are sedentary, um, because we were turning this garden into a nomadic garden, but also we were evoking real ongoing experiments that NASA had just launched, um, growing fresh food for future space travelers. Within NOMA 13, the crops were protected in their travels by Sholot, who, that's the dog there, who took the form of a dog, and he was feared and loved, and this Aztec deity guarded the sun as he traveled through the underworld every night, protecting travelers as they moved through unknown territories, through space and time. And in deep contrast with Victory Gardens, which is what was encouraged uh, in the United States after World War II as the formula for a garden, this capsule contained corn, black beans, prickly pears, sorghum, amaranth, quinoa, chayote, squash, chia, chili peppers, yerbabuena, yerba santa, sage, silk floss tree, and um, this is our last uh, show together with Rafa Esparza at the Commonwealth and Council Galleries, and uh, I'm just going to very quickly tell you, this is uh, based on the sarcophagus lid of King Pakal, who um, was the king of Palenque, and his power was based on the idea that he was able to irrigate, and so he could fill the fields with water and plant um, crops, enough food for all these people. But so we were using that as a reference in Pico Union or Koreatown, where all the Central American immigrants live, but they don't have land. And so we brought all this land to the galleries, but all the gardens were planted on um, water containers that were portable, that came from their houses, and that included plants, um, some of the same plants that we would have in our garden. And it also had this tropical uh, garden, that tropical nomad that had water lilies and containers that the immigrants had used in their fundraiser activities to make tamales and a portal. The ceiba tree, which the Maya use as, I mean, Im Imagine as the portal that takes you to the underworld. We planted one in the middle of the gallery. 
So um, I'm going to stop there because I don't want to bore you, and it's already been one hour of speaking. So this is the work for the Made in LA show. But um, it's called Solkin. It's based on the Mayan calendar that's a garden in front of it. And 20 miles away, talking about the different experiences of living in LA, is the other one uh, by the LA River. And instead of having a garden contained in steel, the, the garden is the river itself. So um, with that, I just um, would like to say that gardens are intermediaries between the Anthropocene and the mark that humans leave on the planet. The plants are survivors of repression, prohibition, colonization, slavery, capitalism, imperialism, eugenics, genetic experimentation. They have survived reminding us of the porosity of their bodies and the futility of borders, and plants leave evidence of our migration as the natural condition of the planet. And I would like to think that in our absence, they will remain latent, preserving future life and the memory of colonialism, racism, migration, but also the memory of our generosity and our courage to survive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you so much. So do you have any questions or comments or complaints? Yeah. <laughs>